Happy Easter. We're so grateful that you're here to worship the Lord with us today. What a wonderful day already. And as we prepare to open the Word of God, John chapter 11, we're going to continue to have a wonderful time as we celebrate the risen Savior. John chapter 11, and I'm thinking on this subject today, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. We're here today because Jesus is alive. We can worship him. We can sing praises because he died on the cross for our sins, but he rose again on the third day. And as a result of that resurrection power, we can rejoice, we can have life, and we can worship the Lord today. The, the reality is there's a lot of confusion about Easter. Easter can be a confusing time. It can be even confusing for adults. It can be confusing for kids. And here, here's why I say that, because we, we talk about Easter like this, like there's this huge male rabbit that jumps around and uh, delivers eggs into baskets full of grass. And uh, most of the time, those eggs are colorful and pretty, and there's a lot of candy, which is fine, except that, like, Rabbits don't lay eggs, right? They don't make nests, and they definitely don't lay colored eggs. It's just everything's mixed up and everything's confusing. Even adults can be confused from time to time. I heard about a guy who's driving down the road the Saturday before Easter, and just out of nowhere, he hit this giant rabbit, and he was sure that he had killed the Easter bunny. He knew he'd killed the Easter bunny. He's like, I've killed the Easter bunny, and I've ruined it. Easter, it's over. He was just there sobbing over this, this dead giant bunny. And finally a woman drives by and she drives by and she stops. And she says, sir, sir, what's wrong? He said, I, I've ruined Easter. I killed the Easter bunny. Look, right here, the Easter bunny's dead. She said, no problem. I can handle it. She walks to her car and she comes back with some kind of spray can and she empties the entire contents of the spray can all over the giant bunny. All of a sudden, the bunny jumps up, hops 50 yards down the road, turns around and waves. Hops 50 yards down the road, turn around, wave. Hops 50 yards down the road, turn around and waves. And the man said, what in the world did you do? What's in that can? He turned the can around and it said, hairspray. Restores dead hair to life, adds permanent wave. That's the worst Easter joke I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> Isn't that bad? I did not tell Stephanie that joke ahead of time because she would not let me tell it if I had told her that ahead of time. There's confusion about Easter even among people right here today. There's confusion about Easter. So our goal today is to teach, to preach what the Word of God says about Jesus Christ about his death, his burial, his resurrection, and that he's alive today so that we can have resurrection power as well. John chapter 11, look with me in verse 25, and we'll look to verse 27 as we think about this subject where Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. John chapter 11, verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who's coming into the world. And today in John chapter 11, we see Jesus Christ in the last I am statement that we are studying in the Gospel of John. He made seven statements, these I am statements through the Gospel of John. And I've saved this one for Easter Sunday as we talk about what it means to, for, for us to understand that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. First of all, notice this. It's an interesting statement. It's an interesting statement. Notice this. You probably want to underline it in your Bible. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The Bible teaches some important things, important things about life, about death, and about life after death. You're born, you live, you die, and you spend eternity somewhere, either in the presence of God forever or rejecting God away from his presence forever. There are only two options for eternity. Jesus says here, I am the resurrection and the life. He clearly says that you can experience life Joy, 
hope and peace and a promise beyond the grave in Christ. Now, not only is this a claim to deity, Jesus is claiming to be God. Because the phrase, I am, is significant biblically. In fact, God uses that phrase, that name in the Old Testament, I am. Jesus does it seven times in the Gospel of John. I am. He's claiming to be God. But even more importantly, I want you to notice what he's saying here. He claims to have the answers to the deepest questions that mankind asks. Jesus claims to have the answers to the the deepest and most difficult questions. Is there life after death? Is there hope beyond the grave? How can I know that I'm going to heaven? Here's what I love most about this. Jesus isn't saying that Christianity is is a teaching that shows the way to life. Jesus is not saying that there are doctrines or dogmas that we have to follow or there's a seven-step path that we have to pursue. This is not about a pathway or a principle. This is about a person. Look at what he says. He doesn't say, I know how to teach about the resurrection and the life. I can tell you about the resurrection and the life. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. You see, when, when you're sick... You don't want a medical book, you want a doctor. If you're in legal trouble, you don't want a law book, you want a lawyer. When I'm hungry, I don't want a menu, I want a meal. Jesus is telling us, all of this becomes personal. Jesus is saying, more than just knowing the way to life or teaching about resurrection, Jesus makes it personal. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He gives us the answer to life, to death, and to eternity. It all rests in Jesus Christ. Maybe you've heard some bones from one of Buddha's fingers was found. It had been given as a gift to the Tang Dynasty in China, and then forgotten until 1981, somebody discovered that China still had some of Buddha's fingers. And so they took the bones of Buddha's fingers and they put them on display, and Buddhists from the entire world would go to see the bones of Buddha. It was a historic, sacred site for Buddhists. If you told a Christian that somewhere, somehow, they had found the bones of the Lord Jesus Christ, they would not believe you. Because Jesus Christ, the Bible says, rose again on the third day and his tomb is empty. There are no bones to find. Christ rose from the dead. He's alive. Heard about a boy and a father that were riding by a cemetery and There was a freshly dug grave and a pile of dirt right next to it. And all of a sudden, the little boy looked up at his dad and said, Look, Dad, one got out. (laughs) Let me tell you about Jesus. The next time you ride by a cemetery, I want you to understand there was one who conquered the grave. He is no longer in the ground. He's no longer in the tomb. He lives today and forevermore. He says, I'm the resurrection and the life. It's an interesting statement. Secondly, I want you to notice this. It's an impressive claim. Here's something that he says. I'm the resurrection and the life. Not only does he claim to be the resurrection, the life. He says, everyone who believes in me, even if he dies, he will live. And he says, everyone who believes in me shall never die. Now think about this for a moment. This is confusing. You may say, wait a second. What is Jesus saying? This is This doesn't make sense because I've known a lot of people who are Christians and I've seen that they have died. In fact, within the last year or so, probably the most famous Christian on the face of the earth, Billy Graham, died. They had his funeral. But Jesus says here, if you believe in me, you will never die. How's that possible? I want you to understand Jesus is not necessarily talking about physical life here. He's talking about spiritual life. And here's how the Bible views death. The Bible views death as separation. I want you to understand what the Bible says. The Bible views death as separation, physical death, and spiritual death. Spiritual death is eternal separation from God. But the Bible says that for those that love and know the Lord Jesus Christ, nothing can ever separate us from his love. 
And so Jesus is saying that when you repent of your sins, place your faith and trust in Christ, you're saved, you have eternal life, you will never die. Your body might die here on this earth, but your spirit and your soul lives on forever. You will live eternally. This is what Jesus is saying. If you, if you die physically, you'll still be alive because your soul and your spirit are eternal. Here, here's how I want you to think of it. If you're only born once, you will die twice. If you're born twice, you'll only die once. Now think about it. Everybody in this place, breathing, listening, your heart's beating, you have been born. You know you've been born one time. In fact, Jesus in John chapter 3 describes salvation, placing faith in him as being born again. So there's physical birth and there's spiritual birth. And here's what Jesus says. If you're born physically and you're born again spiritually, you never die spiritually. But if you're only born physically, one day rejecting Christ, you will die both physically and spiritually. But if you're born physically and you're born again spiritually, Jesus says, though your body may cease to live, your spirit and your soul lives on. This is an impressive statement. Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. You trust and believe in me. You have eternal life. That's the promise from the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's something funny. I believe Jesus was a southerner. And I think I can prove it right here in John chapter 11. The, the New Testament was originally written in Greek, not English. And so Jesus is speaking Greek to his followers. And here's what I noticed when I studied this week. I love it. Jesus uses a double negative in John chapter 11. What, when we read it, we read, And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. But in the Greek, in the original language, there's a double negative. You know what double negatives are, right? We... We're Southerners. We use double negatives all the time. Double negative, like, I ain't got none, you know? Like, I ain't never had, you know? Those, those, are, those are double negatives. He ain't got no sense, right? Double negatives. Basically, what Jesus says in, in the original language, you believe in me, you ain't never going to die. Jesus is from the South, y'all. Amen, right? We have a reason to rejoice, not just that he loves us and died on the cross for our sins. Jesus says, if you believe in me, and really in the, in the Greek, they use it for emphasis. You will never, no, never die. It's an impressive statement. Impressive claim. Not only that, but number three, I want you to notice an important question. Jesus doesn't just look at his friends here. And he says to Mary and he says to Martha, I'm the resurrection and the life. He, he's about to, uh, John chapter 11, he's about to interrupt a funeral. And Jesus, he interrupted funerals. Every time he was at one, he seemed like he interrupted a funeral. And his, one of his really good friends, Lazarus, had died. Lazarus had been dead for four days. And Jesus showed up. Everybody thought he was late. But he came, he came to Mary and to Martha, and he interrupted the funeral. He called Lazarus out of the grave. They rolled the stone away, and Lazarus came out, and he was alive. They would even said, don't open the tomb. He stinks. Jesus said, watch this. Lazarus, come forth. Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. Not just talking about how he gives life to Lazarus. Not just talking about how he's going to rise from the dead. But talking about how you and I can have life today because Jesus conquered the grave. And Jesus says, he's a master at this. He, he's, he's teaching something, but he's also giving this wonderful lesson. And he asks an important question. He is, he's masterful at getting to the point. Here's what he says. Do you believe this? I'm the resurrection and life. You, you believe in me, you ain't never going to die. Do you believe this? One of the most important questions in the entire world. That's a question not just for Mary and Martha, not just for the crowd that day. That's a question for you and me. I mean, come on, you're, you're here on Easter Sunday because you have some type of faith. 
Do you have some type of belief or trust? There's something that brought you here today. Maybe you're, you're questioning. Maybe you're convinced. Maybe you're curious. But I want to break this down for you. Jesus claimed to be God. He said that he would suffer. He said that he would die. And he said that he would rise again on the third day. He claimed to be the Son of God. Beyond that, Jesus claimed to be the only way to heaven. John chapter 14 and verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. He said that he would die a violent death. He said that he would be buried in a borrowed tomb. He said that he would rise again, and hundreds, hundreds of witnesses saw him after his death and resurrection. And here's what it comes down to. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? You see, because here's really what, really what matters. If Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept everything he said. If Jesus really rose from the dead, you have to accept any and everything he says. If he didn't rise from the dead, why worry about anything he says? What this can't be is just kind of important. It either is all important or it's not important at all. You see, if Jesus rose from the dead, then we can't sit around saying, well, I like this about Jesus, but I don't like that about Jesus. I believe this about Jesus, but I don't believe that about Jesus. If he really did rise from the dead, then he is really who he says he is, the Son of God, victorious, conquering King of kings and Lord of lords. If he did rise from the dead, then why haven't you surrendered your life to him? experiencing this promise, the resurrection, and the life. You see, there are pyramids in Egypt. You know why the pyramids are there? They contain the mummified bodies of ancient Egyptian kings. Westminster Abbey in London is famous because there are notable, notable people, renowned people buried there. Muhammad's tomb is noted for the stone coffin and the bones that it contains. The Taj Mahal was built as a memorial to the wife of one of the Shahs of India. Arlington Cemetery, Cemetery in Washington, D.C. is famous because of all the, those who've, who've given their lives in service to their country. But the garden tomb of Jesus Christ is famous not because who's buried there, but because it's empty. I've been there. I've seen it with my own eyes. He is not here. He is risen indeed. <laughs> Do you believe this? I'm not asking if you believe that Jesus was a historical person. I'm not asking if you believe that this historical person somehow died at the cruel hands of the Roman government. I'm not asking if you believe the high priest betrayed him or Judas sold him out for 30 pieces of silver. I'm, not, I'm asking if you believe with all of your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who was born of a virgin, lived a perfect sinless life, died on the cross for your sins, rose again on the third day, and is the way to heaven. That's what matters most. And this is a personal question. It's not, does your wife believe this? Does your husband believe this? Did your mom or your dad believe this? Do you believe this? There's no escaping that question. Do you believe this? Finally, notice in an inescapable choice. Interesting statement, impressive claim, an important question. An inescapable choice for Mary, for Martha, for Lazarus. It's a simple answer. Here Jesus is talking to Martha and he's saying, I can raise your brother up. And she says, I know that you'll raise him again at the last day. Everybody's going to be resurrected one day. He says, I don't want you, to, I don't want you to, to miss what I'm saying here. I am the resurrection. and I have that power. And then he asks her this question, do you believe this? There's an inescapable choice here for each and every person because Christ asks us this question as well. Do you believe? Not do you believe here in your head all the facts and verses and information, but do you believe in your heart and have you trusted everything to him? Do you believe this? She says, yes, Lord. 
I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. This is a powerful profession of faith. So she uses three titles for deity. She says, Lord, she says, Christ, the Messiah, the chosen one. She says, Son of God. I believe you are Lord. I believe you're Christ. I believe you're Son of God. And in the original language, the way she uses that word believe means I have believed and will continue to believe. This is not just a one-time thing. This is something that changes my life. I believe you're the Christ, the Son of God. You see, when he's asking Martha, do you believe this? He's not asking her, do you think that I can raise your brother? He's not not asking her, do you believe that I have the power? He's saying, personally, do you believe that, that Jesus Christ alone is the source of resurrection and power? One author says this. To believe this is to believe that he's that which what he says of himself and thus to believe in him. It's one thing to hear it, to reason, to argue about it, and quite another thing to believe, to embrace, and to trust it. To believe is to receive, to hold, to enjoy the reality and the power of it with all that lies in it, the joy, the comfort, the peace, and the hope. Jesus Christ stands alone as the one and only Son of God who came to die for you and be resurrected again so that he might offer life and hope and peace and eternal communion with God. That's what he offers. The life of Jesus Christ is bracketed by two impossibilities. Think about this. How did Jesus come into the world? It was absolutely impossible to be born of a virgin, but the Bible says Mary was a virgin, and he was miraculously born to the Virgin Mary. It's absolutely impossible to to rise again from the dead. Once you're dead, you're gone. But Jesus, Jesus is resurrected on the third day. The life of our Lord Jesus Christ is bracketed by two impossibilities. The virgin's womb and the empty tomb. He came into the world through a door marked no entrance. And he left the world through a door marked no exit. Think about that. He was able to come into the world in a way that no one else had ever come into the world. And he's able to come up from the grave in a way that no one else had ever come up from the grave. Well, you say, well, there are other people that were resurrected in the Bible. Yes, but they were resurrected and they died again. Jesus Christ rose again, conquering death, hell, the grave, and is alive forevermore, never to die again. Our great high priest lives forever. You probably know that Yogi Berra was a baseball player. But if you know the name Yogi Berra, he's probably more famous for the quotes or statements that he made. He he was known for for being really witty. He'd say, uh, cut the pizza in four pieces instead of eight. I'm not that hungry, you know. You get it, right? He said, I knew exactly where it was. I just couldn't find it, okay? Okay. He said, we're lost, but we're making great time. You ever felt like that? When you come to a fork in the road, take it. Probably Yogi Berra's most famous statement is this one. It ain't over till it's over. You ever heard that? It ain't over until it's over. Think about that for a moment. Because maybe you've heard of a guy who plays golf named Tiger Woods. I began to think just this week, as we saw last week, Tiger Woods put on the green jacket at Augusta National. And I thought back just two years ago. He had multiple affairs, a nasty public divorce. He was arrested for DUI. And this is what Tiger looked like April of 2017. April of 2017. Not a flattering photo. And then, did you see last Sunday what Tiger looked like on April 2019? Notice the difference now. Check it out. Pretty big difference, right? Oh, man. From the bottom to the top. He, he was worried that 
he'd never play golf again. He was disgraced. A lot of his fans threw up their hands in disgust. Divorced, the loss of his father, surgery after surgery, and it was said he may never play golf again. And there he is at the pinnacle At the best of the best, Augusta National, putting on the green jacket. Some are saying this week, it's the greatest comeback of sports history. That's what they're saying. And I know in perspective, I mean, maybe down the road we wouldn't think that. Maybe we would. I don't know. But whether or not it's the the greatest comeback in sports history, I don't know. But I'll tell you this. It's not the greatest comeback ever now, is it? Jesus Christ was brutally murdered by the experts in execution, by crucifixion. He was placed in a borrowed tomb. His disciples scattered in fear. That Friday, all hope seemed lost. One day passed, two days passed, but on the third day, the stone was rolled away. Jesus Christ was risen, they say. He is not here. He's alive, just as he said. Now, that's the greatest comeback story the world has ever heard. And today... Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. If you believe in me, you can have eternal life. Do you believe this?